Today we're going to look at the theology of the Lamb. Uh, within the scope of the major doctrines of Scripture, one of those is Christology. But uh, Christology, of course, is a study of Christ, and a major part of the study of Christ, the Messiah, is the study of the Lamb. And the study of the Lamb, the theology of the Lamb, is the theology of redemption. For redemption is in the Lamb. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. And that is a, the theology of the Lamb. The Old Testament Lamb is typical of the New Testament Lamb, which is Jesus Christ, the one who's the fulfillment of the type. Uh, and so we no longer worship in shadows, we worship in reality, and that reality is Jesus Christ. But we look at theology and we study the Word of God, and from it we get the understanding of God. But understanding of God, otherwise doctrine, it has three purposes. It should it should uh, stimulate our minds, right? It should stir our hearts. But ultimately, it should move our feet. And if those three things don't get done, somewhere along the line, Satan has come in and short-circuited what God has intended to do with doctrine. And so as we understand the theology of the Lamb, it should stimulate our brains. It should stir our hearts. And it should move our feet. Otherwise, when we come to understand who the Lamb of God is, what he has accomplished, and see all that the scriptures have to say about the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world, it ought to move us, motivate us uh, to be more, to do more, and to introduce people to the Lamb of God uh, and, of course, to the kingdom of God. So that is where we're going to go today. We're going to look at these things. We're looking at, of course, Revelation chapter 5, where we have a number of references to the Lamb of God. But we're going to go over to Genesis 49 to start off. The John's vision of Christ as the Lion of Judah was as a sacrificial redemption lamb. He is the Christ. He is the Lion, lion of Judah, and he is the sacrificial redemption lamb. And we need to understand that both of these things have some very uh, important aspects. And there are two aspects of redemption. We have redemption as the redemption of the soul, which is of lost people. That's a, that's the redemption of the lamb. Then we have the redemption of the lion, which is the redemption of dominion. Judah is the lion's wealth. And, and uh, of course, he is, he is the lion of the tribe of Judah who is going to come and restore the kingdom of David, back to the nation of Israel. So we have both of those here in this text in Revelation chapter 5, where he is referred to as the Lion of Judah and the Lamb of God. And both of those things have enormous theological depth to them. I will tell you right now, I'm not going to possibly be able to exhaust all the theology of the Lamb today. I've often thought about writing another book on just the theology of the Lamb. I think it would be a big book <laughs> if we we're going to really deal with all that the Scripture says about the theology of the Lamb. But I tell you what else. The truths of the theology of the Lamb are wonderful truths. They are glorious truths. And there are truths that every one of us ought to cherish. Remember in the Gospel or the Epistle of John, John warned the, the churches that if any man come to you, if anyone come to you and want to preach, of course, and he bring not with him the doctrine of Christ, receive him not into your house. And very much a part of the doctrine of Christ, Christology, is the theology of the Lamb. So I hope today it will stimulate your brains. <laughs> it will stir your hearts. But ultimately, I hope it moves your feet uh, to take this message out into the world because we have a lamb. And that's what we'll see today that a great deal of the substance of the book of Revelation has to do with the lamb of God. And we're going to look at all of those today. So as we come here to Genesis 49.9, the lion was the ancient banner under which the tribe of Judah marched and under which they encamped. Wherever they encamped, the tribe of Judah 
their main banner, their flag that flew over their uh, assembly, wherever they put their tents, was this emblem of the lion uh, of Judah. It was their insignia because of Jacob's prophecy here in Genesis chapter 49, 9 through 10. I invite you to stand if you're able. If not, you're welcome to be seated. But we do it out of respect for God. That doesn't mean if you cannot stand, you don't respect God. Okay, that's fine. Genesis 49, 9. It says, Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down, he couched as a lion, and as an old lion, who shall rouse him up? The scepter, scepter that's the, the rod, the power, shall not depart from Judah. That's the kingship of David. Nor a lawgiver from between his feet. Until Shiloh, that's Messiah, come. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. That's Shiloh, the Prince Messiah. Father God, as we bow before you this morning and look at what you have given us in your word about the Messiah, we rejoice with great rejoicing. And we praise you for what you have accomplished already in the Messiah, Jesus Christ, our Lord, Shiloh. And yet, Lord, we look forward to that soon appearing when you will come to this world, judge this world, and uh, remove the church first, and then return again with your church to rule and reign over the kingdom age. We look forward to all of those things, Father, and our hearts as we listen to all of what you have to say this morning from your word regarding the Lamb of God. We pray, Lord, you'd impress upon our brains these truths, stir our hearts, and move our feet, Lord, to take the message to others. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Well, as we said, the tribe of Judah bore this insignia with great pride, knowing that it was a testimony that God had chosen their tribe through which Messiah, Shiloh, would come. And this refers to the next description of Christ as the root of David in Revelation chapter 5. David was of the tribe of Judah. And Christ speaks of this as a reminder in his concluding statements to the local churches in Revelation 22, verse 16. Now, even though this is the end of the book of Revelation, he is writing this to the churches, remember, the seven epistles. And it is they who would get this message. By, by the way, the book of Revelation is primarily for the redeemed. It is a book for the redeemed. It is revealing Jesus Christ to the redeemed. So we have more theology or Christology in the book of, of Revelation than anywhere else uh, in the Bible. It is a summary of Christology uh, in the book of Revelation. So Jesus, now, now I want you to see that Jesus is both the root of David and the offspring of David. Now I'll tell you right now, that's going to take a miracle. He is both the root, otherwise the source, and he's the offspring of David. Okay. <laughs> that ought to stir you up a little bit. Look at Revelation 22, verse 16. It says, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. So all of this book of Revelation was written primarily to the churches for them to have uh, these issues. And why? Why would he give it to the churches? But why would unbelievers believe it? Believers believe it. So who's going to be going out in the world and telling the unbelievers what's going to happen? Or what is happening in the world right now? Because we're seeing prophecy unfold before our eyes. So he is he's saying, I testify unto you these things in the churches. He says, I am the root, the root from which the genetic line of David grows. Otherwise, it is from the Davidic line that the line of David comes. And the offspring. Jesus became a genetic descendant of David. So he is the original descendancy of David. He is the uh, beginning of David. He is the root of the nation of Israel. Remember? That is the seed. Remember Galatians 3.16. Paul says, not seeds as of many, but seeds as the one which seed is Christ. And that seed, of course, is what's talking about right here. David is part of that seed. What is that? The seed is the seed of the promise, the promise of salvation 
or the regeneration by faith, uh, grace through faith. So he is the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. Now that's a dawning star. We say the dawning star, that's the sun that we see coming up in the east every, every morning. No, that's the dawning star of the new Genesis. That is what this sun that we see every morning rising up in the east, that's just there as a reminder that there is a new day dawning and that there is a new Genesis coming. And so we understand that Jesus is what? He is the root of David. Otherwise, the whole descendancy of David springs from, from the promise of Jesus. And then the offspring, he is a genetic descendant and he is a bright morning star. He is a dawning star of the new Genesis in Jesus Christ. There's so much in this text. <laughs> and uh, we'll, when we get there to Revelation 22, 16, we'll spend some more time there. But Jesus is both the creator, he is the root, the source of the Davidic line of kings, and he is an offspring of it in his incarnation. And both of those are absolutely critical. In the first, he is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, Revelation 13, 8. So this speaks clearly to both the deity of Jesus Christ and the sovereignty of Jesus Christ. Now Jesus is always sovereign as a deity, right? Remember when God, when he gave to Adam, God gave to Adam uh, the dominion over the earth. He said, okay, all of this is yours. He said, but, see that one tree over there? Don't eat of that tree. So God retained sovereignty over Adam. And that Adam, and Adam ate of that tree. He moved himself out from under that sovereignty and relinquished that sovereignty to the God of this world, which is Satan, the prince and power of the air. And that dominion, by the very nature of God's authority, must be restored back to humanity. Because God didn't give it to Satan. He didn't give it to fallen angels. He gave it to humanity. And Jesus is going to restore that. That's the whole substance of this. So this statement that he is the root of the Davidic line and the offspring of it in his incarnation, incarnation speaks clearly to both his deity and his sovereignty. And here's something Salem Kerbin, Gary Cohen said, uh, um, he's, he's a, back in the 60s, he was writing some books and uh, uh, Kerbin is a, a, a um, Arab, and Cohen is a Jew. And uh, they were writing books together, both born-again Christians. And uh, they were experts on prophecy, and I remember going and listening to Salem Kerbin, probably to hear him preach on a, a prophecy conference, and it was a blessing. But uh, they make the following comment on, in, in the book Revelation Visualized by uh, Kerbin. Here's what he says. By Jeremiah's time, the royal line of David was almost destroyed. And the Davidic kings of his day were among the worst sinners of the kingdom. And thus did the Babylonian captivity come, 60, 606 to 533, 35 BC. Yet God promised that some day, hence out of the cut down tree of David's kingly line, would a truly righteous king emerge as a shoot from the roots which still remain? Isaiah 10.33 This shoot, this sapling, this branch was Messiah Jesus. So that is a fulfillment of prophecy that Jesus was born. But his incarnation came in two, two senses. There's the incarnation, which is the redemption of man's soul. That ha that's a cross. Death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and his ascension to glory, where he sits as our high priest in heaven itself, representing us before God as our advocate and uh, high priest before God. In the Old Testament, the high priest could enter into the holy place once every year, an offering first a sacrifice for himself and then a sacrifice for the sins of the people. And if everything was where it should be, God would bless the nation of Israel for the next year. And I get this. We have the Lamb of God sitting upon the throne of God every day of our lives. And he represents us. And so therefore, 
there is a constant flow of blessings to the church. Now, I'm not talking about material blessings, rain falling on our crops. That all of that is all wonderful and good. But what I'm talking about is spiritual blessings. The spiritual blessings is the enabling of the grace of God and the fruit he produces through our lives. Don't get mixed up with the material, which is typical of the spiritual. And the spiritual is what God wants. For us to realize that spiritual blessings are so far beyond physical blessings. Now, my wife and I, we've made a lot of sacrifices in our lifetime to be able to be in the ministry. I have, you know, I was in the business world, could have made a lot of money. But I tell you what, I wouldn't give up one moment of it for the souls that have been saved and the life's been changed through ministry. All of the money in the world can't buy any of that. Couldn't, won't change your life. It is you in the same sense of just be willing to invest your life in people and what God can do to that. That is what opens door here in this whole text that we see. Revelation 5, 5 through 6 is a reminder of the promised kingdom on earth. And the Messiah will set up on the throne of David in a Jewish earthly kingdom. Going to roll the whole world from Jerusalem. Well, not just a little bitty place in, in the Mideast about the size of Delaware. He's going to rule the world from Jerusalem. That's Zionism. Zionism isn't the restoration of the nation of Israel in 1947 under the Balfour Act. Zionism, when, when the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords come from heaven and establish there's a throne in Jerusalem and he's going to rule over the world by distributing it to all born again believers of the church age who will rule with him over the world with a rod of iron. <laughs> I tell you, that's what we see here in the root in the, in the uh, offspring of David. So this has yet to be fulfilled and so is used as a consistent reminder of that which is still to come. That is what the revelation is. It's a revelation of Jesus Christ, the things that are still to come. Christ has instruction Christians that a major part of their prayer life ought to be preoccupied with praying for what? For the coming of his kingdom. Our Father which art in heaven, what's it say? Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, right? And so he said unto them, when, when we pray, pray, say, Our Father which art in heaven. He's not teaching them to pray something in, in constant repetition. He's saying, make this the substance of your prayer life. Here's one of the priorities of, your, of, of something you ought to pray for. Uh, you know, we, we kind of get this out of order. We got, give us this day our daily bread way ahead of this. <laughs> this is a priority. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What's he praying for? Kingdom. When will thy will be done as, on earth as it is in heaven? As in heaven, so on earth here in this day. When will that happen? Kingdom age. That's one that will happen. Satan's going to be bound. Hallelujah. Glorified beings are going to live over, uh, govern the world. Best government the world's ever seen. Jesus Christ will be king. We'll be the kings he's the king of. We'll be the lords he's the lord of. We're going to rule him with him. We're going to be so intimately and directly connected to Jesus Christ. We will know what he knows. And do exactly what he wants us to do. It'll be just like uh, an internet connection, if you will, to Jesus Christ. Immediate upload and download. <laughs> you won't have to worry about how fast it's going to be. It's going to be boom like that. Right there. You're going to have it. Jesus is going to say, hey, there's some people over there that aren't doing what's right. I want you to get over there and talk to them. And the faithful believer priest who is ruling with Jesus Christ over his kingdom, he's going to have to go over and take care of that. And he's going to have to deal with it with a rod of iron. No compromise. See, that's what politics does, doesn't it? What does politics do? Two guys get together and they say, well, here's what I want, here's what I want. Well, let's meet in the middle. 
No, 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 no. That's not what it means. You rule with a rod of iron, there'll be no compromise. It says either or. In fact, it won't be an either. It'll be an or. <laughs> and uh, that's the way it's going to be. He said, that's the way it is. No argument, no, no debate about it. And when John turns to see the lion of the tribe of Judah, he sees instead a lamb as it had been slain. And that's important for us. All the angel, although the angel speaks of the Messiah of the second advent of Jesus, John sees the Messiah of the first advent. Don't get these two mixed up. They're one and the same. They just have different purposes. The Jesus we're going to see in the kingdom age is not going to be a sandal wearing carpenter, meek and lowly. He's still going to be a servant because he is the incarnate Messiah, but he's going to be a ruling Lord and he's coming in judgment. And that's a concept of ruling with a rod of iron. The sovereignty of God is going to be administrated immediately without fear or favor of men without compromise as already said the word lamb appears 27 times in the book of revelation while lion appears once this is significant because the book of revelation is written specifically as a book for the redeemed I've said many times, uh, the book of Revelation isn't tended, intended to be a tool of evangelism. Uh, unbelievers don't, uh, don't believe in Jesus. This is not where you begin the book of Revelation. Tell them the gospel. Teach them about what the Lamb has accomplished. Tell them how to be born again. And then you can teach them the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now I'm going to start, I'm going to give you a few scriptures here that detail the topology and reality that identifies Jesus the redemption of his creation as the Lamb of God. First of all, we go to Genesis 22, verse 7. Genesis 22, verse 7. Now, of course, if we have this way back in the book of Genesis, don't we? Abel offers a lamb. Cain offers the fruit of his hands. So where did Cain get that? How does Cain know to offer lamb? When Adam and Eve sinned, what was their means of covering their sin? Their nakedness. They sewed fig leaves together. And so they, they made loin cloths, if you will. Loin leaves, I guess it would be more like ordinary the cloth involved. But... Uh, they sewed fig leaves together or leaves together and covered their loins. That's all they covered. But God covered them with a coat of skins. Now the word Hebrew coat means something which covers to the wrist and below the knee. So it covers the whole body down below the knee and all the way to the wrist. That's a coat. Now this isn't a, this isn't a coat unless my wife wears it. Then this would be a coat for her. This is just a jacket for me. But if she wears one of my coats, they go all the way down below the knee. So, but that's what a coat is. And so that's God's idea of covering. So where do you get the skins? You had to kill an animal. Animals had to be killed. God took the skins of animals. Topology there is important. Where did... Abel learned that. Well, he learned that from God. Well, Abel wasn't even born yet. Oh. Well, who do you suppose told Abel? I suppose Adam did. Adam and mom and dad told him that. And Abel got saved. He believed in that. And I'm sure that was a practice they had regularly, right covering their bodies with coats of skins. So it says here in Isaiah, or Genesis 22, verse 7, And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, my son. Now, what's happening? They had traveled from, of course, in the wilderness area. They came from Hebron. That's where Abraham is originally from. 
But God had said to Abraham, I, I want you to sacrifice your son. I want you to take him to a certain place. Now, where Abraham took him was to Jerusalem. Now, Jerusalem didn't exist yet. Salem did. Melchizedek was the prince of Salem. And Isaac, Abraham has offered uh, uh, you know, sacrifices or tithes to Melchizedek uh, after the Battle of the Kings, the Valley of the Kings and the winds there. But Salem at that time was a very small city. In fact, they've discovered what it was. The, the city of Melchizedek wasn't very large. certainly wasn't a very big area. It was a, you know, not a very large group of people. But there on one of the mounts by the city of Salem, which would later become Jerusalem, was a thrashing floor. Remember, David bought that thrashing floor from a man by the name of Onan. And it would be there that they would build the temple site. So Abraham takes his son Isaac, knowing where God wants to have him sacrificed, and takes him to that place. Travels a good distance to do that. Now, it's a pretty good trip. And if you didn't know anything about the wilderness area, uh, they aren't going to wait till they get there and get a bunch of wood when they get there. They have to take wood with them. Because in that area, there isn't any. <laughs> Not much at all. So they have to pack some wood upon a, 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 you know, a, a pack animal. And uh, they pack up and they take some servants with them. And they go and travel quite a distance. And they get there to this place. Now, many people think that um, Isaac was a young boy. According to my chronology, I believe Isaac was about 22 years old. So he's a young man. He's not married yet, and that's why they call him a young man. And he is going there with his father, who is a quite an elderly man. And so when they go up to this place, I believe Isaac packs the wood up to where he's going to be offered. I think he knows what's going on. So when Isaac spake unto Abraham, his father, and said, My father, and he said, Here I am, my son. Here am I. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both up, uh, both of them together. Now, I believe Abraham had seen the miracle of the birth of his son, which was a miracle. It wasn't a virgin birth, but it was a miraculous birth. He and Sarah were both past age. They shouldn't uh, have had uh, children. My wife and I were uh, 74, and uh, although we'd like to have another child, we don't have much hope for that. You know, uh, and we only like to have another child for about two minutes when we see a little baby. And then when we hear a cry, we say, well, I don't know, you know, a little work involved in that, right? But uh, um, Abraham and Sarah, they wanted a child, and God miraculously gave them a child out of their old age. And God says, now, Abraham, I want you to go take your son, kill him. I want you to sacrifice him to me. Now, Abraham had already received the promise of the, of the, um, of the covenant, right? That from your seed, I'm going to raise up a, a nations, uh, nations throughout the world. There'll be nations that come from your seed. And now he's, he's talking, of course, about the seed, which is promised, of course, but Abraham understood that that's not going to happen if Isaac is killed and sacrificed. So he's believing that God's going to resurrect Isaac. He may be a killing, but God's going to resurrect him. So they go together, and he says, God's going to provide himself a lamb. Now Isaac, Abraham understood. Maybe what Isaac didn't understand all of this and questioning it, but I think Abraham knew. And the Bible says and Abraham was obedient. God counted him that for him to him for righteousness. Look at Exodus 12, verse 3. 
Here we find this topology um, more fully developed. Of course, we do know in Genesis 22 that God did provide a ram uh, to be offered. But here we find this theology of the lamb here a little bit more. Verse uh, 3 of chapter 12. He says, speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel. So this is, they're still in Egyptian bondage, right? The plagues have all taken place except the last one. Now God is coming to his last test of the uh, proving that he is superior than the pagan and idol gods of Egypt. Now remember, the Pharaoh believed that he was a god. And therefore, his children were the descendants of the God. And Pharaoh had a firstborn. Now, although there were other firstborns in the nation of Israel who died, the primary direction is that against the Pharaoh's firstborn son, who would be the next Pharaoh of Israel. And God is going to show this man and humble him um, before, uh, before the Lord. So Moses is here told, speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying in the tenth day of this month, that's the month of Nisan, which is about our month of April, they shall take to them every man a lamb according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. So you might have 10, 15 people in a house, whatever they might be, and they would take a lamb for a house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, for one lamb, otherwise they're not going to be able to eat a whole lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your account your count for the lamb. Otherwise, you divide it up among the, the people appropriately for people to have a lamb meal. But he's not done yet. It says verse 5, your lamb shall be without blemish, a meal of the first year. You shall take it out from the sheep or from the goat. Now we know uh, in chapter 13, verse 13, that uh, there are some other requirements here as well. The redemption of other animals that break the womb or the firstborn animals or firstborn of Israel. But the male of the first year was required. So it had to be uh, under a year old, had to be without blemish, and so it had to be watched for 14 days to make sure it was without blemish, because it is typifying the, the, the Lord Jesus Christ. In Exodus 13, verse 13, it says, Every firstling of an ass thou shalt redeem with a lamb. And if thou wilt not redeem it, then thou shalt break his neck. Otherwise, if you're not going to give a lamb for the first, the firstborn of an ass, then you should break that uh, the ass's neck. And all the firstborn of man among thy children shalt thou redeem. Same thing. You have to have a lamb for them. So why do you suppose in the Middle East you find so many flocks of sheep? I mean, everybody's a shepherd. They don't believe this stuff anymore. Most of them, but what? It's still, I mean, Israel doesn't offer sacrifices anymore. Where did it all go? It goes back to ancient times, all the way back to before even the book of Exodus, way back to Genesis. That is why in the Mideast, you have people raising lambs and sheep. Now, a lamb could be both of a sheep or of a goat lamb. Um, either one. Isaiah 53, verse 7. Here it talks about the Messiah. It says, He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, as like a lamb to the slaughter. Why was he like a lamb? Because a like was like him, a lamb was like him. He, in fulfillment of that issue, is like a lamb. Then as a sheep before a shearer is dumb, he openeth not his mouth. So he is representing this type over and over and over again, but he is not the type, he is a fulfillment of it. So these people understood what it was, the lamb. Now, 
Uh, I recommend a book. I can't remember the name of the author, but it's called Shepherd Looks at the Lord's Prayer. And it is an excellent book. You, if you have never read it, look it up online and get yourself a copy of it. It is a tremendous book. Uh, I think the man is from Australia, but it, he, he writes a tremendous book on the a shepherd looks at the Lord's Prayer. And it will give you a depth uh, of understanding of what uh, some of this theology is about, probably better than anywhere anyone else that I know of, but it's a really excellent book. And everyone should have that copy in their life. Now, Acts 8.32, it says the place of scripture where he read was this. Uh, he was led as a sheep to the slaughter and like a lamb, dumb before a shearer, so he opened out his mouth. What's he talking about? Isaiah chapter 53, verse 7. That's where that prophecy was. So Isaiah, Acts chapter 8, verse 32, says Jesus is a fulfillment of that prophecy. He is exactly, he fulfilled it exactly. Now, Isaiah 53 is a chapter of scripture that most Jews do not want to read. They leave Isaiah chapter 53 all the way through chapter 55 pretty much alone. And uh, they don't want anybody reading that without uh, someone there like a rabbi to interpret it for you. It's kind of like the Mormons, how we believe in the King James Bible as long as it's interpreted by the Book of Mormon. <laughs> and uh, that's kind of a crazy idea. John 129. <clears throat> Here, of course, we find the, one of the greatest proclamations. Now, it says, The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him. John the Baptist, the one who has prophesied to prepare the way for the Messiah, he sees Jesus coming. Now, John is six months older than his cousin Jesus. He knew about Jesus. He knew, uh, I'm sure, all about uh, who uh, he was and that he was familiar with his mother talking to Jesus and Mother Mary about both of their conceptions and that Mary was conceived, Jesus was conceived in the virgin womb of Mary. I'm sure he knew all about that. But remember, God had said to John, he says, I want you to go baptizing and when the Messiah comes, the one that you're preparing the way for, uh, when the Spirit of God descends upon him and remains upon him, then you will know that this is a Messiah. Now, he had heard all about all of this, but God says, I'm going to miraculously prove to you that this happened. Now, we don't know if anybody else saw that but John, but John saw it. He saw that, but yet John struggled with it. Remember in the prison, he said, are, are, you, the, are you really the Messiah? He struggled with it. Why? Because the kingdom didn't come into place right away. And this was kind of one of those things that was hidden. The, the church age was hidden to the Jew. And they, the difference between the two advents of Christ, those were hidden things to the Old Testament believer. So John, now he sees Jesus coming. And he saith, behold the Lamb of God, which what? Taketh the way the sin of the world. Now, what's he talking about? Forgiving all the sins? No. He's talking about taking away the penalty of sin uh, for the whole world. 1 John 2, 2. He is a propitiation for our sins and not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. What is he taking? He's talking about the remission of the sin penalty for anyone who believes. It's beneficial for all. Um, it's Excuse me. It is sufficient for all beneficial only to those who believe. Otherwise, he... Christ died for the whole world, but it's beneficial only to those who believe. So, he, But he did. He remitted that sin penalty for anyone who wants to receive it. When you're receiving Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're not receiving the forgiveness of all your sins. You're receiving the remission of the penalty of all your sins because Jesus took the penalty of those sins in his body on the tree and he bore them in your place. Then that opens the door for the forgiveness of sin to whosoever who confess your sins. He is faithful and just to forgive your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. That's for restoration to fellowship with God. That is a replacement of all the Old Testament sanct sanctificational rituals. All now embodied just by confessing and repenting uh, before the Lord Jesus Christ. 
So when he talks about taking away the sin of the world, he's taking, taking away the death penalty for anyone who believes. And then John 136, Jesus said, or John says the same thing. And looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, Behold, the Lamb of God. Sometimes when people look upon our lives and say, Wow, you you're you're not the same person. I, I had a man I knew when I was in high school, he came and visited me, and and uh, he said, Boy, it's hard for me to imagine you as a pastor. And I said to him, you know. Pretty hard for me to imagine it too. <laughs> I know what I was. I praise God I'm not what I, I used to be, but I praise, I also know that I'm not what I ought to be yet. It's a long road. And, uh, but I can say to him, Behold the Lamb of God who taketh away the sins of the world. And Jesus accepts you where you are, but he loves you enough not to leave you there. I like what Peter says in chapter 1, verse 19. We'll close with this verse this morning. It's a precious verse of scripture. You know why it's precious? Because it talks about the precious blood of Jesus. But with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Now I want you to see there, it says as of or like. Christ is the fulfillment of the type. We don't bring lambs to church anymore. Aren't you glad this morning we didn't have to have a blood bath up here where we catch all the blood of the animal and, and fill it all up and then, you know, sprinkle the doors and uh, sprinkle you and every place else and then start a fire here on the uh, Lord's Supper table and burn the lamb, cook it, eat it. No, we don't do that. Why? Because with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. That's how we're redeemed. That's the great truth of redemption. Now you need to be, you must be born again. That's the truth. You have to be. There's no other way. You must be born again. That means you must repent of sin and dead work. Stop, stop believing in that nonsense. You can't continue to believe that sin's okay with God. He cursed the whole creation, the whole first creation because of one man's sin because he listened to his wife before he listened to God. Huh. One sin. Repent of sin and repent of any attempt of sacra sacrament or sacrifice that somehow that's going to help you get closer to God. It won't. In fact, it'll take you away. The, the, the Bible says that if you believe in that stuff, you're falling out away from grace, not getting closer to it. Repent. Believe. Believe that God has been satisfied by the death of Jesus Christ for every sin you've ever committed and every sin has been born. The penalty of it has been born in the body of Jesus Christ. Believe that. That's propitiation. Understand that God wants to gift you his righteousness. You want to get to heaven, you've got to be as righteous as God is. And you can't do that because you already start as a sinner. For all of sin comes short of the glory of God. You want to get to heaven, you've got to be as righteous as God is. And the only way that you can be as righteous as God is, is God gifts that to you. And he gifts it to you. That's justification. He gifts it to you in the indwelling person of the Holy Spirit of God. Who is righteous? Believe that. That's believing the gospel. Then confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Jehovah God incarnate in human flesh. He is a redeemer. And then out of absolute desperation, knowing that there is no other hope, call upon the name of Jesus as Lord, as your Lord, to save your wretched soul. And he will enter into your body and you will receive him as Lord. That's so simple to be born again. And why would anybody walk away from that? But it doesn't do any good to know all of that stuff. You have to do something with it. You have to actually do what the verbs say to do. Repent, believe, confess, call, and receive. You have to do them. You know them. It won't save you. Father God, as we bow before you this morning, we are so thankful tonight for this morning that you are the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. That you are the Lamb of God who has taken away the sins of the world. 
that you bore our penalty in your body on the tree. We're thankful, Father, that you uh, want to use us and help us to, today to stir our minds, uh, stimulate our minds, to stir our hearts and to move our feet to take this message into the world. We pray for any that need to be saved, that Lord, they'll do these five things today, believe or repent, believe, confess, call, and receive the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, Lord, get the help they need to do that. Pray for any here today who need to be saved. In Jesus' name, amen. Put your name.